I want to go back to verse 7 and then our, the text here will pick up at verse 9. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. And this is where the text picks up. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. In that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in Him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. That's through verse 21. And this is the word of God. It just doesn't get any better than this. This is some of the most precious words that we can read, especially with the topic of the love of God. And uh, John just goes over and over that again. And when you think about it based in the Gospel of John and our studies in the Gospel of John, this is just absolutely to me some of the most beautiful Scripture we can read anywhere in the Bible. Uh, and especially related to the love of God. Our words are very insufficient to explain the meanings of this Scripture. When we think about it, and uh, we, it, but we're going to see. I want to talk about the love of God revealed to us, and do the best I can. And I shared this a couple of years back. Uh, God's love manifested in three tenses: uh, the past, the present, and the future. In these uh, texts, and so I want to try to do that again today. God's love revealed in the past, obviously, with John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave. The greatest gift of all has been given to us. This is based in the historical truth that God has sent His Son into the world. He, he's proven His love to us because He sent His Son. In uh, 1 John 4, 9, He repeats it. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. The NIV reads, has been shown to us. It's been shown to us that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is how we know God loves us. And so in the revelation of God or the progressive revelation, however we want to say that, in all of time, at the right and proper time, God chose to kiss the world. And when He did, He was expressing the greatest love of all to send His Son into this world. And that love is extended to all of us today. 
It's a wonderful thing to talk about the love of God. I've talked to you about sin. And as we go through the Scriptures, we have to talk about our condition and our terrible condition before God. But we also have to talk about how God's love has been revealed to us. We're not stuck in this condition. God has made it possible that we can experience His love. The greatest gift ever of all has been given to us through uh, God's Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. And His Son, He had one Son, and of course He sent Him, made Him a missionary. And God's the greatest commission of all. We call Jesus' challenge to uh, His disciples to go into all the world with uh, the Gospel as the Great Commission. But the greatest commission was when God sent forth His Son into the world. That's the greatest commission of all. And also, He sent Him, and we're talking about this love in the past, He sent Him as satisfaction for our sin. I want One of the reasons I want to use the New King James because of the English word that's here. There's a vocab word here in verse 10. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. In other words, there was not a love, enough love in our life to merit God's love. We could not merit it or earn it. Not that we love God. That's why He included that. We could not earn or get God's attention this way by doing some religious act or having religious feelings. That would not earn God's love. So he said, not that we love God, but that He loved us. He took the action. He took the initiative. He stepped out toward us. He sent forth His Son. He took the action towards you. You, you were in, unable to take the action toward Him. And so He took... Man's religion tries to take action toward God and claim action first. That's called salvation by works. When, when man tries to take the action first, but in the Gospel, in the wonderful love of God, we see the beauty of it all. God has taken the action first. That's God's grace. God's initiative toward us, reaching toward us. Not that uh, we love God, but that He loved us. That He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That which totally and completely separated us from God was our sin, our condition of sin. Completely and totally kept us from knowing the holy and righteous God. And because of that separation, because of that separation, God expressed His love. He took action. He sent forth His Son, and the English word here, propitiation. He made a satisfactory, atoning sacrifice for our sin. Only Jesus Christ could do that. And so on the altar of the cross, on the altar of the cross, the blood of Jesus was spilled out to make propitiation. To satisfy God's requirement because you've sinned. Because I've sinned. We were forever bound and separated and condemned before God. But He took action. Hallelujah. He, he reached to us first. Hallelujah. When Adam and Eve sinned, God came to the garden. Right? Right? When Abraham went to the mountain, God provided the ram. Right? He took action. God took action. When we see Noah and the flood that's destroying the whole earth, God takes action. Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's an ark to preserve. God took the action. This is the God we worship. This is the God we praise. The God who takes action toward us to show us His love, we cannot deny. None of us can stand before God. No one can stand before God at the judgment and say, you did not take action or you did not do enough. God took the action. He gave up His only Son and expressed His love. To prove His love for us, the greatest sacrifice was made. 
Also, his love was to be, is to be imitated. This is something in the past, an action. Not only God took the action, but the action of Jesus became an example. And Scripture teaches this. We know it's a big mistake to think of Jesus' sacrifice as only an example. That's a big mistake because it's much more than an example. His sacrifice is an atoning sacrifice and it made payment. Something we could never do for ourselves. But His suffering and sacrifice was also the greatest example. In verse 11, He said, If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God could do this for us, and we've accepted it, we believe it, we've received His love in our life. If God could do this for us, we ought also to love one another. And in a sense, we're bound to that. We're bound to it. But He, he uses the term, the old term, ought. Ought to love one another. It becomes that which motivates us to love others. It is it, it, that which pushes us to love others. Why? This is the difference in uh, grace and works in that why would one want to serve God? Serve, quote unquote, serve God. For the Christian view that the Christian has received God's grace, our motivating factor is what Jesus Christ has done for us. We act because of what He has done. For the one who is trying to earn God's favor, they act in order to receive God's favor. There is a difference in salvation by works and salvation by grace. And if you look at the religions of the world, they're all based in works. Trying to earn religious favor from whoever or whatever their perception of God is. Okay? And so with biblical Christianity, we take a step that is really different. We have a message that is very unique from all other religious messages that have ever been in the world. And that, and that is the unique message of God's grace. And the motivating factor, the change of life for the believer is that no longer are we living to earn, but we're living because we've been set free by the grace of God. It's really different now. Life has changed. Greatest example to be imitated. The love for, his love for the world motivated him to send the Savior of the world. John 3.16, of course. And verse 14, we have seen and we testify. And of course, John is saying, uh, this is his eyewitness account. We have seen and we testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. So His own testimony, uh, John's own testimony is that He has seen this. He was an eyewitness to it. The greatest love of all is coming to the world. That's the past. What about the present? He said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him. That's the present. Now for many of you that's already passed in your life because there was a time that you believed, trusted in, and received Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Okay? So for you, your testimony becomes that you have received Christ and that you are living for Him today. So the testimony is not only your past history, but it becomes your present history. As a believer in Christ. I am living for Him today. Because of what He has done for me. Because of having received. Believed and received Christ. I am now living for Him today. His love is revealed in those that believe and trust Him. That they're, they're trusting Him. Simply. Look in 1 John 4.19. He said we love Him because He first loved us. You see, the motivating factor is that He acted first and our love for Him come, it comes from that. And in a true sense, when we read the New Testament, we talk about the transforming power of God's Spirit and God's love toward us that God has reached toward. But He also sent His Spirit 
to enable us, enable us to live, love, and serve Him. He, said, he has not left us alone. He doesn't save us and then say, live, live the best you can. Straighten your life out. He doesn't do that. He, his Spirit comes to live with us. And his spirit, as His Spirit is with us and the love of God is in our life, our lives begin to change. And we learn what it means to live through Christ. To live through Christ. And he says in verse 11, Beloved, if God loved us, we ought to love one another. And so His people love through Him too. They live through Him and love through Him. And this is very important because this is really different than just a principle of religion. It's not just a principle of religion. We're talking about a living Christ. Uh, the loving Christ who by His Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, comes to transform our life. No longer are we the same as before. Change has taken place not because we, we kind of uh, changed ourselves or decided one day that I'm no longer going to be bad. It's not that. It's that He has entered in. He has come to change us. God's love is revealed in the present in your life. 